Welcome to The Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now, here's a message from Pastor Dan Roth. I'm going to get down on my knees and let's go before the Lord together in prayer tonight. Father, we thank you tonight that we get to come into your house and experience your presence and your power, God. Thank you, Lord, for what you've just done in your church, God. Thank you for the anointing of God that's here. Break every yoke, God. Thank you for the healing power of God. Thank you for the blessing of God and the provision, Lord, for the wisdom and the peace that you've given, God. Lord, so many things you've done, too many to name, God. Books could be written about what just took place while we lifted up you and adored you, Lord. And truly, we do adore you, God. This Christmas season, we set our hearts on what you did when you came as a baby in a manger, God. Such an astounding and amazing thing, God. And we just are in awe of who you are and what you've done. Tonight, as we open up your word, we pray that you open it up to us. Open our eyes to see, our ears to hear. Open our hearts to have a good understanding. May we be the good ground where the word is sown. And may it produce something in each and every one of our individual lives. God, we didn't come to hear from a man or a woman tonight, from the young or the old, the black, the white, the brown, any other color we could imagine, God. We came to hear from the true teacher of the church, who is the Holy Spirit. So Holy Spirit, be welcome in this place. Be our teacher, be our guide. Give us the vision, the wisdom, the instruction, the direction, even the correction we need for our lives. Lord, we'll give you all the praise and all the glory for it. All the honor, God, goes to you. And tonight, God, we ask that you bless all of our brothers and sisters, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. We love them, Lord. At no time do we think of ourselves as any better than anybody else, but we see ourselves as co-laborers and workers together in your field, building your kingdom. So God, we ask that you bless all of our brothers and sisters, bless the Baptists, Lutherans, Methodists, Episcopalians, Charismatics, Pentecostals. We thank you for Calvary Chapel and Harvest and Oak Valley and the Well and the Way and for Ecclesia, and Emmanuel Baptist and Trinity, God, for Victory, God, and for the Assemblies and Four Square Denominations, God. We bless our Catholic brothers and sisters and Adventist brothers and sisters, Lord, all those that are lifting up the name of Jesus. God, we don't forget our brothers and sisters that are being persecuted in nations around the globe, God. Pray that you encourage them and bless them as you bless us this night. Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement, we say? Amen. Amen. You can have a seat. Get your Bibles out and go with me to the first book of the New Testament, the Gospel of Matthew. We're going to be in Matthew chapter number one starting out. We're going to be taking a look at the Christmas story. And we have been, for the past couple of uh, weeks, taking a look at different things about the Christmas story. Tonight, the title of the message is Where God Leads. Where God Leads. Each and every one of us in our life are going to be led by something. Some of uh, us, before we were Christians, were led by the flesh, led by desires, uh, led by what we thought uh, was right, led by the world systems, led by education systems, led in different areas of our life. And throughout the Christmas story, we see the leading of God. There were uh, different leadings that took place, the leading of the star. There was the leading of visions, leading of dreams, the leading of, of God speaking to people. There was different leadings that took place. Now, tonight, I want to focus on one of these individuals in the Christmas story who was led in an unusual way, and yet we can learn from the way that they were led about something for our life. This individual is Joseph. You know Joseph. Joseph was the father who fathered Jesus here on the earth as an earthly father, even though we know that God himself is Jesus' heavenly father. Jesus was the son of God, but indeed, Jesus humbled himself and became the son of man. And therefore, Joseph played a very important role in Jesus' life, as well as in the life of his family and in our lives today. See, this is not just a story. This is not just to look good on a history book. This is not just so that the, the nativity scene will be complete. This is something that speaks to our lives here and now. And in our lives, we all are going to either be led by the cares of life, be led by what society around us tells us, be led just maybe like somebody floating in the lazy river, just kind of floating through life and wherever it carries you, that's where you end up and hopefully it ends up good. See, that's not the life that I want to live. I want to know that I'm following the right lead. And God has given us leading. God has given us wisdom. God has given us direction from his word, number one, but as well through his Holy Spirit. And God gives us that guidance. So where can we expect that God will lead us? If we look at the life of Joseph, I believe that we can find out where God is going to lead us. And if we know that God is leading us in a certain place to a, to a certain destination, then we will understand that, hey, when I get this leading, I know it's God. Is that right? See, because God's not going to lead you to a place that's not healthy for you. God's not going to lead you to something that's contrary to his word. And therefore, if we're going to be led by God, we need to know and understand the character of God and how 
God operates. So we're going to take a look at the life of Joseph. We're going to be taking a look at some different ways he was led. In fact, Joseph had dreams. He was a dreamer. I could have entitled this message, Dreaming of Christmas. Because Joseph had four different dreams that, that led him in three different instances to different places. And we can learn in our lives... Wow, if Joseph was led there, then that's the character of God. Then when God leads me to that same spot, I know that God is doing something in my life. Are you listening tonight? So where can we expect God to lead us? God leads us to. A couple of things we're going to take a look at tonight. God leads us to. First one God leads us to is courage. God leads us to courage. Anybody here Sunday night? All right. Okay, good. Good amount of hands. But the majority of you guys were not here Sunday night. Oh, my goodness. Sunday night, Pastor Jim dropped some wisdom on this house. And if you did not get Sunday night's message, you need to just go to the CD counter and get it tonight or get it online. It's free online. You can download it, listen to it, watch the video, podcast it. Any number of ways, we just want to get it into your hands, okay? And, and, and the only reason why we charge for the CDs is just for our materials and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, so it's only like $6,000 over there. But, but anyways, um, so you can get the CD tonight if you want. But my goodness, Sunday night, if you want to find out more about being a courageous person, a person of courage and what that looks like, get a hold of Sunday night's message. But God leads us to courage. You can see this all throughout the Bible. In fact, one of my, my favorite men of the Bible is Joshua. I identify with Joshua in a lot of ways, and I, I can see how Joshua, being a, a young leader, being raised up and being ready to take on the responsibilities of the nation, crossing over into the promised land and doing great and mighty exploits. He had a war ahead of him, and here God was leading Joshua to be strong and of good courage. Tells it to him numerous times in the first chapter of Joshua. In the same way, we see the same thing that God did in the life of Joseph. Led him to be a man of courage. Matthew chapter 1 Verse number 18, starting out, says this. It says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph. Everybody see up on the overheads. I, I highlighted that word after. Everybody see that up there? Okay, after. I want you to note that for a second. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, comma. Now look at the next word. Before. You see that? So we've got an after and we've got a before. So after his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came Together. Now, I, I'm going to spell this out for you guys so that you understand what's being said here. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, see, in their society in that time, the betrothal period was actually about a year long process. But they did not consummate the marriage, come together as man and wife, until their actual wedding day. However, that betrothal was like you were legally married, you were husband and wife. And if you were not going to get married during that betrothal time, you actually had to write a paper of divorce in order to separate, okay? So this is saying after his mother Mary is betrothed to Joseph, so yes, she's betrothed. Yes, they're essentially legally married before they came together. So they had not yet had marital intimate relationships. Everybody know what I'm saying? Okay, did that spell it out clear enough? She was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Now, we get the rest of the story that she was with child of the Holy Spirit. But Joseph didn't have the Bible yet to read about what was going on in his life, right? He was living it at the time. So let's look at the next verse, verse number 19. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. See, now the verse makes sense, right? Because we understand that Joseph... If he found his wife pregnant before they came together, had a problem, right? That this woman was unfaithful. And therefore, Joseph had the right as the husband to do a number of things. He could have drug her out into the middle of the elders of his town and had her put to death. He could have written her a paper of divorce and spit in her face in public. But Joseph, being a just man, some of your translations say he was upright. This guy was a righteous man. He lived an upright life. And notice that this is written in the Bible. This is the Holy Spirit talking about him. So God looks at Joseph, and God sees the heart of Joseph, and God says, Joseph was a just man. He was an upright man. And not wanting to make her a public example, he didn't want to have her put to death. He didn't want to spit in her face. He didn't want to shame her. He loved her, and therefore was minded to put her away secretly, quietly. He was just going to wash his hands of it, and back away. He was just going to do that. Now, 
Next verse says this. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Now he gets the rest of the story. Notice he has a dream. Notice he has an angelic visit. Notice it's a supernatural leading of God that takes place, telling him what to do and why he should do it. Verse 21, and she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Once again, direction is given. This is what you're to call the child. This is how you're to name him. Verse 22, so all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, behold, the virgin shall be with child to bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Verse 24, then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took him his wife. And did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son. And he called his name Jesus. couple of things there. Number one, I want you to notice that Joseph, even though he was minded to secretly, quietly put her away, now had courage to do the will of God. See, once the will of God was known, he had faith to receive it and he had courage to carry it out. Are you listening? And so what he did was he went and he took his wife to himself. Now, the fact that she was going to start showing... People would probably say, well, wait a second. They just got betrothed, and they're getting married here, and she's out to here. Something's going on, right? And the talk would start, and the gossip chain would start up, and people would be looking at them funny, looking at her funny. And any husband in this place can identify when someone's looking at your wife funny, something's wrong, right? What you looking at? And so here he is. He has the courage to carry out the will of God. Why? Because the will of God is now known. He's not afraid to take to her his to, to himself his wife, to take her as his wife. And he now has the word of the Lord. This is that which was spoken. He hears the word of God, which now he has faith, and he receives it. He believes it, and then he is courageous, and he does as he was commanded. And look at the next verse, 25. And did not know her till he... She had brought forth her firstborn son. In other words, he so respected what God was doing in Mary that he didn't even come together as husband and wife until after Jesus was born. What an amazing man. What an amazing thing he did. See, Joseph, even though he was quietly going to do something courageous, now he quietly does something courageous. He just goes, puts his head down, and gets to work. Sometimes... In, in our society, we, we look at quietness as cowardness, right? We look at that as, well, you're quiet. You're obviously a coward. Why don't you speak up? Why don't you say something? But if that was true, then Jesus would have been a coward. Is that right? When Pilate was railing in his face and telling him, why don't you say something? Why don't you speak? When the Sanhedrin was yelling at him, are you the Christ? When, when they had all these trials, these illegal trials all throughout the night, what it, he was like the lamb before its shears. He was silent. He was quietly doing the will of God. The same way Joseph did the same thing. But just as there's a time to be quiet, there's also a time to speak out. There's also a time to act. There's also a time to move and courageously do the will of God. That's why Jesus could say things to the Pharisees like, woe to you, you whitewashed sepulchers. You who clean the outside of the cup, but the inside is filled with filth and dirt, right? So there are times where courage looks different. And we see in Joseph that Joseph was led by his righteousness to do something quietly, but he was led by the word of God to do something openly. In our lives, it's no different. We need to know the will of God and be led by that will of God so that we can quietly, courageously, as well as openly and, and, and frankly do the will of God. What does that look like in our lives? It looks like several things. It looks like shutting up when you know you need to shut up at the Christmas table. Hello? See, because relatives, friends, neighbors, people are going to be at your Christmas table and they're going to start mouthing off and you know they're wrong. And yet, if you can zip it in love and walk in love and love them to life, bear with them, long suffer with them. When they bring up, hey, do you remember last year when you drank so much that it came out your nose because you were laughing and all? Hey, just be long suffering with that, right? When they start talking about how terrible your food is, Oh, if I would have cooked this, well, why didn't you cook it, sucker? You know, you're kind of like, what's going on here? I got to endure you? You know, yes, be long-suffering. Be courageous enough to shuttest thou uppest. That's the King James Version, by the way. 
But in the same way, be courageous enough that when God opens the door for you to speak into their life, when you get a moment alone with your brother and you're sitting there and he says, you know, my life's a wreck, what do I do? You say you turn to Jesus, let's pray together. Be bold, be courageous. I don't want to push them away. You're not pushing them away. They open the door. You're just walking in. That's what this is about. And we can be led to be courageous. You need to be led on the job to be courageous. When the person that's working beside you says, hey, can you cover this? And you know it's not right. You say, no, I can't cover it. Come on. You know what? Let's, let's be courage. Let's be bold about this. You made a mistake. It's okay. It's going to be all right. God's going to take care of you. When, when you're there with your family and now all of a sudden the kids are going nuts and they need to get out and you need to be long suffering with them moms, right? And dads. Be courageous enough to hold them in your arms, to love them, to, you know what, you've had a long day, yeah, but put yourself out there for the betterment of your family. Go the extra mile. Put dinner together. Sit with each other. Ask them what was the best part of your day. How are you doing? Let's pray together as a family. Let's believe God before they go to bed. Read the word of God together. You need to be courageous enough to lead your home in the righteous way. Hallelujah. Hold your finger there in Matthew or put a ribbon or pencil or something like that there in Matthew. Turn me to John, the 16th chapter. John, the 16th chapter. And in John chapter 16, verse number 33, Jesus is speaking. Last verse in John, the 16th chapter, it says this. These things I have spoken to you. This is Jesus speaking. He says, I've told you some things. You have the word of God. That in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. You see those words good cheer up there on the overheads? I should have highlighted those words good cheer. Okay? Maybe they can do that for me there in the back. These things I've spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. In the world you're going to have trouble. You're going to have trials. Guys, do you have that in the New Living Translation? Did I put that up there too? If so, switch over to it. But if not, just leave it there. There we go. Look at these guys. They're good. They're good. He says, I've told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows. What does that mean? That means, in other words, you're going to have things happening in life. Things are going to come your way. You don't have to go out there and look for trouble. Trouble's going to find you. In fact, Jesus said, don't worry about tomorrow. Tom tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble, right? Every day there's going to be obstacles. There's going to be challenges. There's going to be a devil out there waiting to try and beat you up. There's going to be people that don't like you. There's going to be world systems that are against you. There's struggle and toil and things that have happened because of the fall. So in the world, you have many trials and sorrows. But take heart. You know what that means? It means take courage, Take courage. Be strong and of good courage. Why? Because I have overcome the world. In other words, you're going through this, but it's a course that's already been ran. Jesus, the Bible says, is the captain of our salvation, and he's already suffered and gone before us, and now he's on the other side, and he's saying, come on, church. Come on, son. Come on, daughter. You can make it. You can do it. You just have to have the courage to face it, and I will guide you through and carry you through each and every step. We can be led to courage because Jesus led the way. He left us his spirit and he gave us the direction from his word. God leads us to number one courage. Second thing that God leads us to, we take a look at back in the book of Matthew, this time chapter number two. Second thing that God leads us to is this, safety. Not only to courage to face the trials, problems, and the pressures of life, but also God leads us to safety. God's going to take care of you along the way. Matthew chapter 2, look at verse number 13 this time. We're going to read through verse number 15. Matthew chapter 2, starting in verse number 13, says these words. It says, Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. This guy was a dreamer. You notice that? Second time now, here Joseph is dreaming, and God knows how to get his attention. Maybe he was like me and knew how to sleep really good. So an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise! Take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. Verse 14, when he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt, and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, out of Egypt I called my son. So what did we see 
that God led Joseph and his family to safety. Now, in our lives, God wants to lead us to safe places. In fact, if you read the 23rd Psalm, it's amazing the leading of God. He leads me beside still waters. He leads me to lie down. He leads me. And what does it say? He says he prepares a table for me. Where? In the presence of my enemies. In other words, you can sit down and have a meal and not have to worry. Why? Because God has everything under control. Don't got to worry about it. Don't have to fear. Part of the Holy Spirit's job description is that he will show us things to come. See, sometimes those things that God shows us are good things. Like, hey, you're going to be doing great things. And you go, yeah, praise the Lord. But then sometimes the Holy Spirit's going to say, hey, watch out for this. And we say, wait a second, is that God? Does God really show me things that, that could be a hurdle? Well, yeah, we see this all throughout the Bible. You see God showing the Apostle Paul trials and tribulations and persecutions await you in Jerusalem. There was a prophet named Agabus. They took Paul's belt off of him, tied himself up, hogtied him. So I can just picture him laying sideways on the ground saying, the owner of this belt is going to be tied in the same manner. It's like, oh my goodness, are you kidding me? They're all begging Paul not to go to Jerusalem. And yet, because he had a word from God, because the Holy Spirit had shown him things to come, he took courage and knew that God was going to safely carry him through every step of the way. That's why he said, listen, I'm ready to go to Jerusalem and even to die for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet God carried him through and we see the plan of God. That's why he could go through shipwreck and being snake bitten and, and, and persecuted and beaten and stoned and whipped and lashed and everything else. All the riots that broke out all around him, Paul was led to safety. Why? It wasn't that he didn't have any problems. It wasn't that he didn't have any pain, but God took care of him every step of the way. It's the same in our lives. You may be dreading going to work tomorrow. You may be dreading seeing the family this Christmas season. You may be dreading the next round of bills coming in the mailbox. You, you might not be looking forward to going home to the neighborhood that you're going home to. And yet, Church of God, I'm here to tell you, God will lead you to a place of safety every time. Every time. Many times I've been led to places, didn't know where I was going, what I was doing. God just said, go here, do this. Didn't know why. Sometimes I'll be driving home and God will say, don't take the freeway, take side streets. Anybody else have that happen to them? Yeah, look at this. That's the Holy Spirit leading you out of an accident. Now, I go and check the newspapers and check the, you know, the internet and all that kind of stuff. I wonder if there was an accident. Maybe, maybe I can testify. No, it didn't happen. You know why? Because I wasn't there. It wasn't meant for anyone else. And yet God was showing me. In fact, uh, when I went on my missions trip, I was uh, a young teenager went on a mission trip. We went to Jerusalem. We were on, uh, doing our main ministry. It was on a street called Ben Yehuda Street, all right? And, uh, it's, you know, kind of a city center place. Two weeks after we had left that place, it was bombed. Suicide bombing right there. And we were all going, man, that's amazing. I was just talking, in fact, to uh, Dr. Baron Gilflin, one of our missionaries. He goes to this church, and so he was with us at our Christmas party the other night. And I was asking him about his trips. I said, man, you have been all over the place recently. He goes, yeah, I just got back from Australia. I was there in Sydney. He goes, man, it's crazy. Seems like everywhere I go, you know, we leave Jerusalem and then it's bombed. We leave, uh, you know, we were in, in Lebanon and, and all of a sudden all sorts of stuff broke out there. And then we went here and this happened. We went there and this happened. Then I was just in Sydney, Australia. And a lot of you guys know what just happened in Sydney with the terrorists and, and, uh, and the hostages and all the situation that was there. Just days after he left. See, God will lead you to a place of safety. There is no safer place for you than right in the center of the will of God. Let God lead you. There's no safer place than to follow his lead. Why? Because if God is leading, you'll be under the shadow of his wings. Nothing can touch you when you're under the umbrella of the almighty God. It's kind of cool. And if you want to keep your finger there in Matthew, once again, chapter 2, and turn over me to Luke. Pass the book of Mark. Find the book of Luke. Luke chapter 1. Right at the end of Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1 is a really long chapter. Verse number 78 and verse number 79, Zacharias is prophesying about his son here, and, and he starts to cross over and stops talking about John the Baptist and starts to talk about Jesus. And look at what he says in verse number 78. It says, through the tender mercy of our God, with which the day spring from on high has visited us, verse 79, to give light to those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death 
to guide our feet into the way of peace. Sometimes you don't know the leading of God. With anything else, you know that the word of God is true, but this, I can't find this in the word. You haven't heard from the spirit. Spirit hasn't spoken to you. And yet, when you think about it or when you start moving in that direction, there's a peace that covers you. And you know that peace. It's the peace that passes all understanding. And God is showing you that he's guiding you. Why? Because there's a way of peace. There's a way of safety. There's that safety inside of it. It's almost like there's this blanket of protection that's wrapped around you. And you just say, I know that this is the direction. There have been times I've been led to give, and I, and I haven't had the money to give, and yet the peace came on me. And I said, you know what? This has got to be God. I know that peace. That is the same peace that led me when I gave my heart to the Lord. That's the same peace that filled me when I was baptized in His Spirit. That's the same peace that's guided me along the way. And I can trust God's leading. Why? Because He's going to lead you to a safe a place of safety, not to a place of ruin. Can you say amen? amen. Last one for tonight. Last one for tonight. Is this helping anybody? Yeah. Praise the Lord. Good. I, I, if not you, it's helping me. Okay? Where God leads. First one, God leads us to courage. Second one, God leads us to safety. Last one for tonight, God leads us to purpose. Purpose. Number three, God leads us to purpose. Matthew, the second chapter, our dreamer Joseph, once again. Matthew, the second chapter, verse number 19 through verse number 23, says this. Now when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. For those who sought the young child's life are dead. Verse 21, then he arose, took the young child and his mother, and came into the land of Israel. Verse 22, but when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea instead of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there, and being warned by God in a dream. Remember, the Holy Spirit will show you things to come, so here's the character of God. He's warned by God in a dream. Once again, that's the fourth dream we've seen tonight. He turned aside into the region of Galilee. Now, we would say, well, pastor, that's peace again, right? That's safety again, right? It isn't, didn't you just talk about this? Look at the next verse. Verse 23, and he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth that it might be fulfilled. Did you catch it? That it might be fulfilled. See, there was a purpose and there was a plan and there was a destiny and there was a prophecy that God had for Jesus, but it had to be fulfilled. And so God used his leading, the way he knew he could get a hold of Joseph, to lead Jesus into his destiny. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. In our lives, when God leads us, God is not just leading us into courage, faith, getting a hold of the promises of God. God is not just leading us into a place of safety and protection and peace. God is leading us into our God-given purpose and destiny. The Bible records that God has planned good works. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, I know the plans that I have, have for you, says the Lord, plans for good and not for evil, plans to give you a future and a hope. Ephesians, we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which he has prepared for us beforehand. See, God has good works that he's planned for us to do. There is a destiny. There is a purpose. There is a place for each and every one of you. And this season, maybe you've been focusing on the wrong things. Maybe you've been focusing on how lonely you are. Maybe you've been focusing on why not me or why them or why can't I or what you don't have instead of what you do have. I'm here tonight to help you realign your focus into the right place. And that is that God has a plan, a purpose, and a destiny for your life. And God will lead you into that. There's an assignment, there's a schedule, there's a destiny awaiting you out there. Recently got a, a Christmas update letter. You guys like those letters? Little updates, this is what's going on in our lives, this is what's happening, and it was a friend of mine. And so, you know, I was reading through the letter, and I just thought, man, I'm going to call this brother. You know, I just love this guy, and, and, and want to see how he's doing, and the, and the letter reminded me of him, and so I called him up. As I called him up, uh, I started asking him questions about some, some of the stuff in the letter. Hey, I heard this, and how did that go, and what's going on here? And he, and he starts sharing it with me, but he shared it with me in a way that it, it, he's telling me the truth, and, and, and he's speaking faith, and I know that when this situation happened, it was not that way. I know, I'm thinking on, on the other end of the phone, I'm thinking, this guy's got to be discouraged. And I know he's ramping himself up in faith right now, and he's expecting me just to join in. And I stopped and I said, I'm going to tell you a story right now. And I, 
just started to tell him a story that encouraged me in my life in a hard time. And I just started to pour into him, just started to tell him, you can do this. Don't give up. Stay faithful. God's in that. Right now, it's not looking very good, but you know what? In the future, God's going to do some great things. And in this story, if God could do that there, then, then how much more can God do in your life if you just remain faithful? Someday, you're going to tell that story, and it's going to be an awesome story, and it's going to be a witness and a testimony that it wasn't working here, but I stayed faithful, and God worked it out over here. And man, I just started to pour into the brother. Started to encourage him, and, and, and he was on the phone on the other end of the line. He says, I'm going to get off the phone because I don't want to cry, man. So just, just get off the phone with me. I love you. Later, you know, and just hung up on me. And so I, I just was, was happy that I got to do so. Later on, next day, as a matter of fact, I get a text from the same guy. And he says, man, you were just so used by God. You don't even understand. See, I thought I was just calling a friend who I was reminded of because of a letter. But God had an assignment. God knew, man, this guy needs encouragement. God had my number to get a hold of me to say, call this guy, and you can just walk into your purpose, walk into your destiny. See, you may not have dreams like Joseph where an angel shows up and tells you exactly what to do. We would all love that, right? I would love that, most certainly. Please give me the next sermon series. Give me, you know, just tell me what to invest in in the stock market. Uh, give me, yeah, I mean, come on. You, you've thought about this stuff, right? Tell me what to say to my neighbor. Tell me how to work out this situation. Tell me how to be the best on the job. You know, what do I need to do, God? Just tell me what to do and I'll do it. Oftentimes, we don't get those audible voices or those dreams or those visions. What we have, though, is we have the Word of God. And like Joseph, if we stay right, stay just, keep our noses clean, stay out of trouble and stay faithful with God, God will urge us and move us and nudge us and get us to the right place. And you will look back on your life and you will see the fingerprints of God all over everything that you've ever done and say, my goodness, God was leading me here. God was guiding me there. God was showing me this here. I didn't realize it, but now I can see God all over it. Thomas Watson said this, he said, if God be our God, he will give us peace in trouble. When there is a storm without, he will make peace within. The world can create trouble and peace, but God can create peace in trouble. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's our God. That's our God. Last verse for tonight, Psalm chapter 139. Turn there with me. Psalm 139, right there in the middle of your Bible, just about. Psalm 139, great psalm. You want to learn about God's purpose for your life and how much God thinks of you. You can read the whole psalm. It's just amazing. Psalm 139, verse number 23 and verse number 24. Last two verses. The psalmist writes and he says this. He says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. Aren't you glad that you're not the only one who's ever encountered anxiety, fear, trouble, trials of life? Verse 24, look at what he says, and see if there is any wicked way in me. Now, we have to define what wicked is for a second. Anything evil, anything wicked is anything that is contrary to the way of God. So if there is a wicked way in me, that means that it's a way that is leading me away from God's way. Are you listening? So he says, see if there's any wicked way in me. And then look at what he does. He yields himself to the leading of the Lord. And he says, and lead me in the way everlasting. In other words, if there's a way in me that's contrary to your way, God, change my course. Change my direction. Lead me in the right way. Guide me in the way that you would have me to go. Lead me in the way everlasting. You know, you can pray these prayers. You can take the word of God and pray it over your life. God, try me. Know my anxious heart, God. Take a look inside, God, and see if there's any wicked way in me. And God, if there is, Lord, I'm ready to change. I'm ready to follow your direction. Lead me in the way everlasting. Because God, I know that you have a purpose. God, I know that you have a plan. God, I know that you have a destiny for my life. I know that you've got good works awaiting me. God, you want me to love the unlovable this Christmas? I'll do it, God. You want me to bless somebody this Christmas? I'm ready, God. God, you want me to tell someone about Jesus? Oh, God, just open the door and I'll speak, Lord. Tell me the right time, the right way, God. And Lord, I trust your Holy Spirit to speak on my behalf when the time is right. Lead me, God, in the way everlasting. Hallelujah. Tonight, what did we learn? We learned how God leads us, where God leads us to. Leads us to courage, 
leads us to safety. He leads us to purpose. All we need to do is look for and listen to God's leading. Did you guys get something from the word tonight? <laughs> Hallelujah. Hey, I want to talk to you guys before you leave this place tonight. You guys have been great, and I just appreciate you guys staying put. I want to talk to you about your eternal life. It would be a tragedy if we came to this place and talked about the leading of God and had such a great time in praise and worship, singing songs to the Lord and, and just rejoicing together. And then we let you go from this place and you walked out of here and your heart wasn't right with God. You died and you ended up in hell and you didn't go to heaven. Now, sometimes people say, well, pastor, I don't believe in hell. You know, that's like a fairy tale people made up. It's not real. I, I just, I just, I'm not going to go to hell because it's not real. The problem with that thing is, you know, the Bible talks about hell. Old and New Testament. Jesus himself spoke of hell in the Bible. Therefore, it's a very real place, and you're not going to avoid it by ignoring it. You can't just bury your head in the sand and not expect to get touched by the wind. In the same way, you can't ignore hell, and it goes away. You're going to have to face the reality of it. I don't want you to go there. You don't want you to go there. But most of all, God doesn't want you to go there. Never intended for you or me, made for the devil and his angels that rebel. The Bible tells us that God is long-suffering and waiting. Why? Because he wants to fill up heaven. He wants you with him. So how do we get to heaven? Sometimes people say, well, pastor, all roads lead to heaven. I'm going to make it there just doing my thing. You know, you do your thing, I'll do my thing. Churches out there can do whatever they want. We'll all make it there somehow, some way. You know, just stay true to yourself. That's all that we need to do. And while that sounds good and I wish that were true, it's not. You know why? Because nowhere in the Bible does it say all roads lead to heaven. That's like saying all roads lead to the moon. You ever tried to get to the moon driving around the earth? You can drive around the earth as long as you want. You will never make it. Same way, you can't make it to heaven just by doing your thing or my thing or, you know, the church's thing. Staying true to yourself. You're not going to make it. Jesus came and he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. What does that mean? That means it's God's heaven and you're going to have to get there God's way. Sometimes people say, well, pastor, I know that God's way is about being good. I've been a really good person. Yeah, I used to be bad, but cleaned up my act. Now I'm good. In fact, now my good really does outweigh my, my bad. And, and, and so I think that God sees that and appreciates that. He's going to let me to heaven for being good. I've helped people out, given money to charity, gotten involved in social justice causes, been nice to my neighbors, been a really good person. I, God's going to let me to heaven because I'm good. Now, while that's great and I'm glad you've been a good person, could you just show that to me in the Bible where you help people out, and give money to charities, you're nice to your neighbors, or get involved in social justice causes, you get to go to heaven? Listen, God is not some jolly old Saint Nick in the heavenlies, making a list and checking it twice. Who's been naughty and who's been nice? It's not how this works. Can't be good enough to get to heaven, because the Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's only one who is perfect. His name is Jesus. And the Bible records that our good works compared to God's goodness are like filthy rags. You're going to get thrown out. Not going to get to make it. Not going to get to stay. Today, can I love you enough to tell you the truth? You're not going to make it if you think that you can just be good enough and get there. Sometimes people say, well, pastor, hold on a second because uh, I was raised in church. My parents told me we were Christians growing up. They hung a cross or a St. Christopher around your neck. Had you baptized or christened as a child. Took you to religious classes like Sunday school or catechism class, maybe Sabbath school class. You're born in America. America's a Christian nation. Everybody born in America is going to heaven. We're not any other religions. We're not Buddhists, Muslims, Hindus. We're Christians. And therefore, we get to go to heaven, right? Wrong. You know that nowhere in the Bible, check it out, nowhere does it say your parents raised in church tell you you're a Christian. That makes you a Christian. Nowhere in the Bible say you wear religious jewelry, be baptized a Christian as a child, that you go to religious classes or be born in America, that you get to go to heaven. And I don't see anywhere in the Bible that it says that because you're not some other religion, that by default, God lumps you into the category of being a Christian, headed for heaven, denying your presence in hell. Simply put, if that's how you think you're going to get to heaven, you're not going to make it. I love you enough tonight, respect you and honor you enough to not play games, tell you the truth. You're not going to make it. Somebody said, well, pastor, okay, I understand that. But you know, uh, not only when I was a child did I go to church, here I am sitting in church right now. Uh, here I am in front of you in church. Doesn't that mean something? I consider myself to be a Christian. And while that's great, and I'm glad you're here tonight, could you just show that to me in the Bible? You sit in church service, call yourself a Christian. That makes you a Christian. That's like me putting on a Dodgers uniform, driving to Los Angeles, going to Dodger Stadium, sit in the dugout, bring my bat and my ball, and think that I'm going to get to play in the game. You know what's going to happen? They're going to find me sitting there, drag me out and lock me up. Why? Because I am not a Dodger. Never have been, never will be. Therefore, you can't just sit in church, call yourself a Christian. That makes you a Christian. 
You say, I, I get that, I understand that, but you don't understand, Pastor. My last church, I got involved. I helped out, sang in the choir for a number of years. Made decisions in that church. People thought of me as a leader. Carried the pastor's Bible. I, in fact, I taught in the Bible classes. Even got a membership card to that church. That's great. I'm glad you did those things. Just show that to me in the Bible where you help out. Make decisions. People think of you as a leader. You get a membership card or make decisions or teach in the Bible classes. People think of you as a leader. You get to go to heaven. It doesn't work like that. God's not waiting at the gates of heaven, checking how much volunteer time you put in or looking for your membership card to a church. Simply doesn't work like that. So he said, well, pastor, okay, I understand that, but you don't understand. My last church, someone told me that if I knew God, I'm a Christian. I know God. I know about Jesus and Easter and the resurrection, celebrate Christmas and sing the songs every year of my life. I could quote scriptures to you, pastor, Old and New Testament. Doesn't that mean that I'm a Christian because I know God? Well, let me ask you a question. If you'd read your Bible, don't you know that demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? They're not Christians. Haven't you read that the devil himself knows who Jesus Christ is and can quote scriptures out of his mouth? Does that qualify him for heaven? No, absolutely not. So why do we think that if we know who Jesus is in our head, that gets us right with God? Listen, look up at me for a second. Look up here. It's not about what you have in your head. It's not about having some mental ascent towards God, knowing who Jesus is, and that gets you right with God. Rather, this is about your heart. Jesus was speaking to a religious leader of his day by the name of Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a good guy. Did a lot of good deeds, raised in his church called the synagogue, became one of the leaders, got involved. He attended on a regular basis. In fact, people started to look to him to find out about God. He became a teacher of Israel. He held to the strictest form of the law, the rules, and the religious regulations. He wore the right clothes. He talked the right talk. He could quote the scripture. He could debate the scripture. How many of us could do this? He sang the scripture. And yet when Jesus comes and speaks to this great man of Israel, he doesn't pat him on the back and say, Nick, man, hey, hey, keep doing what you're doing and I'll see you in heaven. No, rather, what does he say? He says, Nicodemus, you want to enter the kingdom of heaven? You must be born again. It's that simple. You want to enter the kingdom of heaven? You must be born again. You say, but pastor, hold on. I saw that in a movie. I read about that on the internet. That's weirdo stuff. That's goofy. I don't want to have any part of that. Well, listen, let's not let Hollywood and movies and television and society and the internet Define for us what being born again is. Let's let the Bible define that for us. What does being born again really mean from the Bible? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. It's that simple. It's that simple. It's all or nothing with Jesus. Let me prove it to you. Last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, Jesus is speaking to a church just like he's speaking to us here in this church tonight. And he says, when I come... I want to find you hot, or I want to find you cold, because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Those are pretty gross, graphic words from the mouth of Jesus, but what's he talking about? Lukewarm, what's that? Well, it's a little in, little out, a little up, little down, a little token prayer every now and again, an occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. You're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus, you're not going to make it. How do I know that? Because think about it for a second. Only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. But tonight, it doesn't have to be that way. Tonight, you can give God all of your heart and all of your life. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father who is in heaven. But if you deny me, I will deny you. So I'm going to give you this opportunity here in a moment. I'm going to count to three just like this. One, two, three, bang, pop my hands together. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together just like that, bang, that's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand when you hear that sound is you're saying, I'm going to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. Say, whoa, 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 wait a second. Time out. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Uh-huh. You might be. Let's push past that tonight. Because think of the trade-off. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to end up in hell forever and ever and ever and ever? No one make that trade. And yet tonight going to try and talk yourself out of it. The devil's going to try and talk you out of it. Listen, put your flesh under. Tell the devil to go jump in a fiery lake. You're going on with God tonight. Listen, this is a safe and friendly place. No one's judging, criticizing, condemning. We're rejoicing. We're excited for you. We've all done this at one point or another in our lives too. Now it's your turn. Will you give God all of your heart and all of your life? Probably won't even be embarrassed, but even if you are, it's better. Who should raise their hand in a moment? If you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm speaking to you. 
Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on, tonight, make sure. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this, never given God all of your heart and all of your life? Come on, I'm speaking to you. Or finally, who should raise their hand if you're lukewarm in this place? You know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. Get ready to get your hand up all across this auditorium. Back in the family rooms, wherever you're at, watching by television in the foyer, down in the Love Rock Cafe or online, across the nation and around the world, God sees and God's watching. If you're here on campus, either telling us or, or coming to the church service right afterwards, if you're online, click the button that says Respond to God. You see it next to your browser. Or on our homepage, you can click the button that says How to Know God. And someone will lead you in a prayer. I'm going to count to three. Pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Just raise them up high for me right now. If that's you, need to give God all of your heart. Need to give God all of your life. Just raise it up high for me. That's you all across this place. Come on now. Where are you at? Don't tell me they all walked out during the announcements. Come on. Where are we at? You need to give God all your heart and all of your life. There's one back there. Thank you. God bless you. Up there. Oh, got you. Thank you. Waving his hands because I can't see. God bless you, man. Who else? Thank you. Right over there. God bless you. Who else today? Come on. Don't be shy. You're not alone. And I didn't embarrass them and I won't embarrass you. There's two wise people. Come on. Just lift your hand up if you know you need to do this right now. It's going to give you a moment. If you know that God's tugging at your heart, come on, it's this easy right here. Just lift your hand up. Let me know that's you. Come on. We got number three. Just pop it up high for me. If you know you need to give God all of your heart, know you need to give God all of your life. Is there anybody else? Anybody else? Come on, just raise it up high for me. Can I share something with you? This is unusual for Wednesday night. Usually we've got a lot of people that respond. And so that's why I want to take a moment. We got some time in the service, so I just want to make sure. I'm not trying to talk you into anything. But at the same time, I know the difference in my own life from before and after. Before I was saved, miserable, depressed, lost. After, clarity, vision, purpose, destiny, joy, peace. Everything we talked about, that leading of God, that comes because you gave your heart and life to Jesus, and now you're following his lead. The first step to following the lead of God is the leading of salvation. And if you haven't given God all your heart and haven't given God all of your life, come on. That's you. Just lift up your hand and let me know that you want to do that. You want to follow that first leading of the Holy Spirit. Give him all of your heart and all of your life. Is there anybody else? Anybody else? Just take a moment. Search your heart if that's you. Last call and then I'm going to wrap it up. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else in these center sections? Come on, just pop it up high for me if that's you. Anybody else? Over here. Thank you, number three. God bless you. Hallelujah. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Amen. They were pointing. I didn't, I don't know. Here's what I want to do. Over there. Thank you. Got you right there. Got you over here. Thank you. Amen. Amen. That's cool. It's all right. Listen, if you're going to start raising your hand, I'm going to go back. Anybody else? Let's go. Come on. Where are you at? Anybody else? Come on. Come on. Let's go. If that's you, you've been waiting. You said, oh, I missed it. You started clapping and I got scared. If that's you, let's go. Come on. Let's go. If that's you. Be, hey, God will lead you to courage, right? God will lead you to safety. This is a safe place. And God will lead you to destiny. Your destiny is wrapped up in this moment right now. Your eternal destiny. This is a good thing. And you've heard the word of God. You have faith to receive it. Now you just got to move on it. Anybody else real quick? Because if they're going to start raising hands, I got four, I got five. Come on, do I hear six? Do I hear seven? No, I'm not selling nothing. Just giving away the free gift of salvation. Anybody else? Thank you. God bless you. Anybody? Wait, 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 wait. Shh. You're scaring away my fish. Thank you. Okay, you can put your hand down. Anybody else? Come on, let's go. That's you. Anybody else? You know it's you. Just pop it up if that's you. You know God spoke to you. You know it's you. Anybody else? See, I'm having fun now. Who else? Anybody else? Now let's give the Lord a great big praise. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God, praise God. 
those of you that raised your hand, I don't even know how many of you are. I'm going to, by faith, say 12, right? Because there was only seven. But I'm going to say, by faith, 12. All of you that raised your hand, or if you should have raised your hand, but you didn't. Once you get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, a friend if you need a friend. Once you get in the aisle and meet me up front, because we're going to change destinies here tonight. So get your stuff, whatever you brought with you. Get a friend if you need a friend. Get in the aisle and meet me up right now. Let's all stand and welcome them. You come right now. Just make your way to the front. If you raise your hand or you should have raised your hand, come on down. Come on down. Jesus, I believe. Hallelujah. They're coming. Let's give them a hand. You can come too. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. I belong to you. You're Brother, the family rooms, come on down. You can bring I your children. You're the reason that I breathe. It's your time. This is your moment. Jesus, I believe in you. Jesus, I belong. All right, hallelujah. You guys came. Praise God. So excited for you. So excited for the destiny that God has waiting for you guys. Right over here to my right, your left, this is Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel's a really good guy. Nothing weird's going to go on. You know, sometimes you go to church, you wonder, are they weird? This is about as weird as you're going to encounter today, okay? He's cool. He's going to do three things with you. I'm going to let you know what they are in advance so you're not wondering or afraid. He's going to, first of all, lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. You're going to be born again. Secondly, he's going to give you some free information, some free literature to help you find out what to do next in your walk with God. And then finally, He's going to give to you absolutely free what we call a spiritual personal trainer. Heard of a physical trainer in the gym helps you get strong, right? Spiritual personal trainer is a friend in church who will come alongside you for five weeks, teach you five things out of the Bible, one a week, meet with you a couple minutes before church and just encourage you in some things of God, help you to hear the word of the Lord so you can be courageous to do the will of God. And, and, and after that five weeks, you're going to be strong and know what to do in your walk with God. Now, let me make a promise to you guys, okay? Give us one year here at the Rock Church World Outreach Center. One year consistently sitting under the teaching. If you can make it Wednesday nights, come on. Every Wednesday night for a year, get in here as much as you can. Uh, maybe you can come Sunday mornings too or Saturday mornings. Maybe you can come Sunday nights because you're working in the mornings. We understand that. That's why we have 11 church services a week for you guys, okay? So I would encourage you, get into two. Be radical, get into three church services as you can, but be consistent. If all you can get is the one, get the one. If you can get the two or the three, get them. And after that year and for the rest of your life, here's the promise. Promise that you will look around your life and say, my goodness, I did not know I could be this blessed. Am I telling the truth, everybody? Take their word for it, okay? You guys will make a left turn. Follow Pastor Joel right this way. Come on, let's give him a great hand as they go. Hallelujah. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me. And then he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins. That I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven, as well as upon the earth, that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.